You guys ready for the last of our Oh What Fun series? Yeah. That's right. We're, we're going to wrap up this year in style. We're going to continue to have some fun together. We, we have uh, just some, uh, you know what? I just can't get over looking back at 2017, what God has done at this church. Isn't it amazing? Let me, let me tell you just one little cool statistic just from last week. We had 1,250 people join us for our, New Year's, our Christmas Eve services. Isn't that amazing? And just to speak to, to how well you guys did at inviting your friends and your neighbors and, and, and coworkers, we had 300 more people than the year before join us for Christmas Eve, which is awesome. So thank you so much. You know, 2017, as we look back, has been just a testimony after testimony of the way God has been working and growing in this church. I've, I've mentioned we're, we're growing at a, like a 12% growth rate, which I, I'm still trying to figure out what that means, but it's just phenomenal as far as churches are concerned, how God is working within the, the walls of this church to help us fulfill our mission and vision of reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. So I just want to tell you guys how thankful I am as we're finishing up this unstoppable theme this year. Let me tell you what, we have a theme that we are going to unveil next Sunday. We have been praying over what God wants to do in this church, not only in 2018, which is what we're going to show you uh, next week, but we also have a three-year vision, our 2020 vision, that over January 7th, 14th, and 21st, we are going to show you where God is taking this fishing boat. And it is really, really exciting. You don't want to miss it. So if you want just a real quick, easy New Year's resolution, be here January 7th. 14th, 21st. You don't want to miss it. Your Christmas Eve, uh, we had an incredible time here. It was awesome. I woke up the next morning and my back didn't hurt at all. Some of you know what that means. Um, my legs were a little sore, uh, but not my back. You know, I'm used to actually lifting heavy things on Christmas Eve. Let me, let me tell you what, I, what I'm talking about. When I was in high school, my friends and I from my youth group, we started a tradition we would go to a, a tree farm like across the street where the trees are already cut down and they're just kind of self-standing. And we would go there a couple days before Christmas and ask permission. We would say, hey, on Christmas Eve, if we come at midnight, can we have whatever trees are left? And they were always really gracious. They would say, yes, absolutely. You can have anything that's sitting here. So what we, we came up with this idea one year. We rented the biggest U-Haul truck we could find. And we went to this tree farm at midnight, and we filled up the U-Haul as packed as we could get it with all the Christmas trees left at this tree farm. And then we went to our youth pastor's house, and we set up a Christmas tree farm in his front yard. <laughs> and uh, we thought it was ingenious and great. He didn't think it was as funny as we did. But uh, you know, Christmas Eve, we just, we've been having a great time all month long. And we don't want to, uh, we want to keep that going as we're talking about, oh, what, oh, what fun and uh, entering into this little odd middle area where, you know, we can't really, we've got to stop saying Merry Christmas as of today and we've got to start saying what? Happy New Year, Happy New Year right? It's the 31st. It's a, tonight is a big night. Tomorrow is a big day for us. And we're starting to talk about uh, these resolutions and, and changes as we look back and things that maybe weren't quite right in 2017 what are some changes that maybe we need to adopt uh, to make 2018 even better? Right, that's kind of where we're at. So let's pray and ask God to help us as we talk through that a little bit. Father, I ask right now that you would be a part of everything that happens in this room. You were beyond obvious and prevalent in our worship this morning. It was just amazing to watch you working. And God, it's, uh, uh, we, we continue to open up our hands and to invite you to be a part of this message time. God, as, as I speak, I pray that you'd be speaking through me. I pray that your presence here would be uh, very obvious and that each of us would be able to walk away from this, this morning, myself included. God, just feeling closer to you, seeing our lives be more transformed into the likeness of your Son. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wanted to share with you a little bit um, as, as you're putting together your New Year's resolutions for 2018. We did some research and we have the top 11 resolutions that people have already committed to for 2018. 
So if you want some ideas, uh, here would be a few that, that some people have shared. Number 11. So we're going to go backwards in order. I'm going to do this David Letterman style. Okay, so number 11 uh, was find a better job. It was the 11th most popular. The 10th most popular was to find love. So that seems like a good one. Uh, no, number 9, do more good deeds. It's a, a, a nice selfless act there. So that, that's good. Uh, number 8. Learn something new. I think that's probably the one I feel like I hear the most when I ask people. It's usually, I want to learn how to play guitar this year. I want to learn how to speak Spanish. Or I want to learn. It's kind of associated with learning a new skill or something. And maybe maybe some of you right now, you're like, yeah, that's me. I want to learn something new. Number seven is to work out more often. Anyone in here thinking, yeah, that might be a good one to consider? A lot of us, right? Um, Number six, spend more time with family and friends. That's a good one. Uh, Number five, do more exciting things. Anyone in here already have a plan for something in 2018 that's fun? Maybe a trip you got already going on. You're going to do something awesome. You're going to maybe jump out of a plane for the first time. Anyone got something like pretty? Well, a lot of people, they say, you know, I'm going to do something exciting in 2018. Uh, Number four is to quit smoking. That's a really good one. Uh, Number three, make better financial decisions or get out of debt. Something related to personal finances fits into the third spot. The second one is uh, basically it it says life and self-improvements. That's kind of vague. I don't really know what that means, but some sort of improvement uh, to your life or yourself in some way. And and then number one, you can probably guess it. What is number one? Lose weight. That's right. And then the number one spot is to lose weight. And I look through this list, if I'm being completely honest, and they all sound like really good things, don't they? It's like a good list. You're trying to figure out what can I do better that I wasn't that great at in 2017, and we want to find something good. So here's a good list to start with, but here's what I want to challenge us all, myself included, this morning. Jim Collins has this quote. He says this, it says, good is the enemy of great. Few people attain great lives, in large part because it is just so easy to settle for a good life. We even have a word for it, a phrase for it, don't we? We call it the good life. You know, you, you see someone on Facebook, maybe they're sitting at the beach, and they got their feet up, and you can see the water in the background, and it's just one of those beautiful sunset pictures. You know, hashtag the good life. Right, We understand it's a phrase that we're familiar with, but what if at ACC we say, you know what, we don't want to be uh, followers of Christ who settle for good because good is the enemy of great, and we believe that 2018 can be a great year. So this is what I want to challenge us on. I want to look at some possible New Year's resolutions that we as a church could adopt in 2018 that instead of having kind of a temporal, earthly focus. Uh, They're good things. None of those things are bad, but to maybe uh, supplement or replace them with a resolution or a a, a decision of something that points to the one who really makes a difference, something that's going to grow us in spiritual maturity, something that's going to make an eternal impact. I want us to look at some of the things that we could change in our lives to, to help us not just have a good 2018, but to have a great 2018. That's where we're going uh, this morning. A habit is, is a word that I want us to understand because a habit is something that uh, it, it's, it's important to understand. In fact, I put the definition up on the screen for you. It's this, an automatic behavior that occurs without much conscious thought. And in order to understand where I want to go this morning, to understand what a habit is, it's, it's important. I'm going to get a little scientific here in a second and explain uh, habit from kind of a, a science perspective. But you think about it, it's something that just happens without a lot of conscious thought. It's not something that you, you have to think about too much, right? It's something that just kind of happens because it's, it's part of, it's a habit of yours, Right? Uh, MIT has done some research in, on the brain and how the brain works as far as habits. And before I get real scientific, let me just give you this disclaimer. At this church, 
we do not believe that science and religion don't match. We believe that science and religion are two awesome things that go really well together. And the way we understand that is, is we have a God who loves us so much in our faith that he provided this thing called science that gives us the opportunity to do our best to figure out how he did it and why he did it and how it all works. So science is something really cool. I love science. And uh, there's this part in your brain called the, the basal ganglia. And I, I don't want to sound overly smart right now. I just figured this out yesterday, okay, in, in, in studying this. So uh, the basal ganglia, it's a part of your brain. And in that part of your brain, there are two parts that are really important for how we form habits. One part is the, the dorsolateral striatum. And in the dorsolateral striatum, it's the part that's kind of the sensory motor, uh, you know, your smell, touch, feel, like the kind of your sensory things get processed somehow through that. So if I were to take on something new, for example, let's say I decided in 2018 I want to take on salsa dancing. I just want to become an you know, awesome salsa dancer. Now the first time I go, maybe I, I salsa dance, and while I'm doing it, I, you know, the music, the way it hits my ears, is just really great music, and, and the way my arms feel as I'm f- gliding across the stage, right, or whatever, maybe there's just something about that experience. My, my dorsolateral striatum is kind of triggering, saying, wow, this is really something you like. This is something good. Right? There's another part called your dorsomedial striatum, and it's more responsible for connecting uh, and uh, kind of understanding how different things connect. And it's responsible for the reward kind of piece of not only did I like the salsa dancing, but my dorsomedial striatum is telling me, wow, you like that. Go ahead and, and start remembering uh, the connection between pleasure and that thing. And it's going to be something that you'll want to do more often. So this other part of your brain processes these other things. And, and don't get me wrong. Sometimes what happens, we, we, we like something, we do it often, and it becomes a habit. But there are some things in our life, right, that we don't necessarily like right off the bat. They take a while to become a habit because, let me give you an example. I am not a runner, okay? I've never been a runner, but I know there are people in this room right now that are runners. Anyone want to raise their hand? Any runners in here? People who like like to get up and run like five miles in the morning? No, okay, we're we're a lazy bunch. That's good. All right, listen. (laughs) But... So last service, we had two runners, at least that I know of, that were really into running in the room. And they will tell you, when you first decide to take on the habit of running, you don't wake up just thinking, man, I can't wait to go out and run five miles, right? So you go out, and maybe your dorso uh, lateral striatum in the running, maybe your, your muscles hurt and your, your, your shins are you know, whatever, and it's just it's tiring. And, but at the end of it, your dorso medial striatum is processing, wow, that, I feel great. I feel like that was a really good thing. I'm breathing better. My day's going better. I, I'd feel less depressed. You know, whatever these different, the way it all works, it's, it's fascinating. But these two things working together help your body to form a habit. And the research shows that it takes 66 days on average for a habit to form. That's really important to understand. It takes 66 days for something that is very a conscious decision, that you have to decide every day to do this thing. On day 67, on average, it starts to become more automatic. It becomes something that you do, not something that you have to do. And it's important to, to know that number 66 because we're going to get back to that here in a minute. Uh, there's a quote from a, a, an author named Ann Voskamp, and she says this, It's not what you do every now and then that changes anything, but what you do every day that changes everything. In other words, we need to understand that some of the habits that we need to apply to our lives, some of the things that we ought to to maybe consider in 2018, we want to look at things that we can be doing daily, that we can be changing in our lives to move us from wherever we are in our, on our faith Maybe in your faith you are pre-Christ. You have yet to, to make a decision to follow Christ and to make him the Lord of your life. Uh, maybe some of you, you're, you've, you've made that decision, but you're still very immature in your faith. You're still maybe like an infant in your faith. You know, you still need to be fed and, and helped and walked along, and that's okay. I'm really glad uh, wherever you are in this journey, this is a really great place to be right now. 
So we have people in this room who maybe haven't decided to follow Christ yet, people who are young in their faith and a little bit immature in their faith, and then there's people who are like our giants of the faith over here that just seem to have kind of figured out a lot of those Christian habits. Most of us are probably somewhere in between here. And these habits that I want to talk about here in a minute are things that will move us wherever we are on the spectrum from immaturity into maturity. And these are the things that really matter. They're not the temporal, but the eternal things that we ought to consider as we move into our new year. So I have this acronym that I want to share with you. And this acronym, typically acronyms are designed to help us remember something, right? We put an acronym together so that we can remember the steps of something or the whatever. Uh, In this case, unfortunately, this acronym doesn't help me remember it at all. Maybe it will help you. Uh, but every time I hear this acronym, I have to go back and look at the paper. What does the T stand for again? What does the I stand for? Uh, maybe for you, it'll be a little easier. If nothing else, it'll really help you take notes this morning. So if you want, we are going to use the acronym HABITS, H-A-B-I-T-S. And we're going to walk through that word together. And I'm going to make some suggestions for resolutions that will make 2018 great instead of good. Here's the first one. The H in habits stands for hanging out with God. As you can see, we had to flex a little bit to figure out how to get these to fit into habits. So hanging out with God is going to be number one. This is really an obvious one on how to grow in your relationship with Christ. Let me, let me give you an example. When my wife and I started dating, guess what we did? We hung out together, right? All the time. We, we found excuses to spend time together. We, we'd say, oh, you want to meet uh, to go study for our Old Testament survey class? We didn't really want to study for Old Testament survey. We just wanted to spend time together, right? We wanted to talk. We wanted to ask questions. We wanted to get to know each other because we were developing a relationship. It's simple, right? If you want to develop a relationship with someone, you've got to spend time with them. You've got to talk to them. You've got to listen to them. I, same, same kind of phase of my life, my wife, when she gave me my first love letter, you know, that first in our relationship had kind of matured to a point where she wrote me a note telling me her feelings for me. I took that note and I kept it in my pocket because I loved random times throughout this process of, of dating, being able to pull that out and open it up and just kind of read how special our relationship was It was just a reminder, right? That love letter was precious to me. Well, guess what? We have one of the most incredible love letters ever written. And it's God's Word. He he tells the story of His love for us in His Bible. And we have the ability to open this anytime we want. We have the freedom as Americans to, to out in the open, to take a Bible and to open it and to read out of this love letter and to build our relationship with God and to spend time with Him. Another way you can kind of look at spending time with is, is abiding in. And there's a, there's a verse I want to share with you. It's in John 8. It says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In other words, if you spend time with me, if you abide in my love letter, You will learn truth. And as you take that truth and apply it to your life, it's going to change you. It's going to bring freedom and joy into your life. So maybe this H, this hanging out with God, is a resolution you need to make in 2018. Let's look at the second one. The second one is this. It's attending church. Now this might seem like a a shameless plug from the pulpit, right? The pastor's getting up asking us to attend church more often. But listen, let me tell you an interesting statistic. On average, most families attend church one and a half times per month. That is the average church attendance for most people in this room. That statistic is true at ACC. When we look at uh, all the, the people that are here right now based on your connect cards and we look uh, next week and the week after that and the week after that and we kind of figure out what is the average attendance for most families in our church. It's just coming to be a part of church one and a half times on average per month. And I, I want to challenge that, that kind of that thought for a moment. See, we believe that we're a family, that God has called us to be the body of Christ and to be a family. 
And taking that a little further, if you are a Christian who isn't part of a spiritual family, we have a word for that. It's called an orphan. We have a lot of people who are walking through this Christian life as spiritual orphans. They're not plugged in to a family. They're not plugged into the body of Christ where we're able to encourage and, and, and worship together and to grow together and to pray for one another. These are really important things that God has called us to. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. A couple words I want to point out there. One you see as some are in the habit of doing. You see habits can be very good and habits can be bad, right? We all know about bad habits. This, this verse says, listen, some of you have a bad habit of not joining together and attending church together often and regularly. And I want to encourage you, maybe that's you. And the other thing we see in here is, is all the more as we see the day approaching. What this is meaning is from the time this was written until now, every day that we live, the day that Jesus is going to come back and fix all this, that day is getting closer and closer and closer. And the commandment in God's word is as even more, every day as we get closer and closer to that, we ought to be more and more committed to coming together as the body of Christ. And yet somehow that statistic, that 1.5 times per month, if you just went back 50 years, you would see that most families had uh, just church was something that you, you did. It was a four time a month thing. And we're seeing this trend of the, the importance of attending church together as a family is declining, not following this even more, all the more as the day is approaching. So maybe... Uh, maybe this is just a, a, you know, men in this room right now. Maybe that's something you need to commit to right now. As, as a, God has called you to be the leader of your home, maybe you need to commit right now. Maybe this is your 2018 resolution. I need to make sure that as often as is reasonable that I have my family in church, that we're a part of what God's doing. And maybe it's not here. Maybe God's calling you to somewhere else. Uh, that's not as important. It's being a part of the local church is important. Uh, the B from habits stands for being generous. I have never been ashamed to stand on this pulpit and talk about giving. I know a lot of pastors talk about kind of it's, it's not fun to talk about and people in the congregation don't like to talk about money. But being generous, believe it or not, is something that we feel as a fishing boat model church we believe that God has called us to something amazing, that God has given us a really specific mission and vision, and that in order to accomplish that, we need a, a room full, a congregation full of people who are behind the mission and vision of this church and say, I am in. How can I help? And we're not just talking about money. We have these three T's. It's time, talent, and treasure. You see, we believe that all of the time that you have all of the talents you've been given and all the treasure that's in your bank accounts and is parked out in that parking lot right now and is at home on the land that you own, everything that you have, the Bible teaches us that it's God's, that he has placed you in stewardship over those things. In other words, you're a manager who gets to manage his resources. So what you're really doing when you understand how important it is to be generous with your time and your talent and your treasure is worshiping God by saying, I know that everything I have is yours and I'm not going to hold any of it back for myself. Uh, you, God, you know, actually only asks us, uh, maybe this needs to be your 2018 resolution. There's a thing in the Bible called a tithe where God says, listen, a tithe is another word for a tenth, meaning uh, when, when God blesses you with this income, one way that he asks us to worship him and to remind us that it's all his anyway is to give a tenth of it back to him through the local church. And I believe and I know that the average uh, in this church and in the churches across America is 3%. We don't do a good job of being generous and being faithful to worship God through our tithes. Maybe that's something God might prompt and, and lay on your heart for 2018. 
If you turn with me, I want to uh, look at this verse in, in Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, there's one in the chair back in front of you. Go ahead and grab that Bible and you can turn with me. We're going to be on page 632. 632. If you grab that Bible, by the way, and you are holding it in your hand right now and you know that I don't actually have a Bible at home that I could have brought, go ahead and take that Bible with you. Just write your name in it. We want you to have this. Uh, We believe the Bible is the greatest love letter ever written and we want you to have a copy of it. So in verse, uh, verses 1 through 4 of Luke 21, it says this, While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, the poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. It's an incredible truth. You see this poor woman who gave far less than, than all the other people were just giving a, a little tiny portion of their surplus. And she gave, according to the Bible, everything she had to live on. You know, we, we understand, listen, God isn't calling uh, most of us in this room to give uh, like that. He, he only actually asks us to give 10% back to him, and sometimes he'll lay on our heart to give above and beyond that and to give uh, a, a lot more than that. Sometimes we know in Scripture that he'll call people to give everything they have to the church. But we see this example where this woman, uh, she had just these two small coins, and she understood that they were God's to begin with, and that he was going to take care of her, and she went and put everything she had, which wasn't very much, into the offering of the church. And God said she gave far more than everyone else because she gave with a worshipful heart, trusting God. Let's be great in 2018, and maybe that's one way you could do that. Uh, The I in habits stands for investing in healthy relationships. Investing in healthy relationships. Listen, I, um, I think it's really important for us as believers to, to be in the world, but not be of the world, right? The Bible tells us to be in the world, but not of the world. So I'm not saying here, make sure when you go outside of this church that all of your relationships are godly relationships because that would be sad. If you don't have any relationships in your life where you're able to share Jesus with people, you know, we're talking like your neighbors and coworkers and some friends, those are really good relationships to have because they give you an opportunity to be a light in, in those lives. But what I, what I want to talk about as far as investing in healthy relationships, we have this uh, we have an understanding in the Bible when God tells a, a married couple to make sure that they're evenly yoked. And that word, sometimes we don't understand what it means. Let me explain it. A yoke is something they would put around the neck of two oxen. So you'd put an ox on one side and you'd put an ox on the other and you put this yoke around their necks so that they had to work in unison. Now what happens if you take a really strong ox that's been built for just this purpose and it's, bam, it's healthy and ready to go and then next to it maybe you put a young, weak or maybe sick ox that's not ready to pull the weight of this load. What's going to happen as these two try to work in unison, one is going to get dragged, the other one is going to be slowed down, this cart is going to end up moving in circles. It doesn't work, right? When you take your, when you're choosing one ox and another ox, you take them and you choose them and make sure they're equally yoked. That's what that phrase means. And God calls us in our relationships, your most precious relationships, Like God calls us in in our marriages to be evenly yoked, to be building one another up, that you don't have one uh, spouse holding the other spouse back in their spiritual journey. And I think the same is true in your best friendships. When you think of someone in your life right now that does the most speaking into your life, that when you have a question or a concern, maybe you go to them for advice. They're the one that you spend the most time with and they have the most influence over the decisions you make. You ought to make sure those most important relationships in your life are evenly yoked relationships that you are finding people to surround yourself with that are believers, that understand the same faith that you understand and that are walking the same journey with you. 
that are building you up and not tearing you down, that are helping you to move forward and not walk in circles in your faith. So maybe that's where you need to uh, focus in 2018. Maybe you need to really invest in healthy relationships. My closest friends in high school, uh, my, the guys I spent most of my time with, they were in my youth group with me. These are the guys that we went Christmas tree together for the youth pastor's house, right? These are, these are like my buddies that, that we would hold each other accountable. When someone would say something inappropriate, we, would, we had code words that we would say to each other like, man, knock that off. That's not, you know, God has a better plan for you. We, we would encourage each other in our walks. It was, it was awesome. In fact, when I talk to those guys on the phone, even today, the phone call always ends with the same phrase, I love you. Because these guys, man, I have no shame at all. That's how close they are to me. They've, they've had an incredible impact in my life. It's important to surround yourself with people like that. In high school or in college, I had a roommate that, that cared about me enough that if something was going on in my life, he, he was willing to, to, to stop eating and to fast and pray for me. These are the kinds of friends we ought to have. And let me tell you how you can find those most easily at ACC. It's through a life group. So you're getting plugged into a group that meets sometime during the week and being a part of that community where people are praying for you and they're, they're encouraging you and they're, maybe when you're in the hospital, they're visiting you, bringing you meals. They're, they're really taking care of you. The best way to see that happen is through life groups. Maybe that's what you need to invest in in uh, 2018. Here's the T. The T stands for telling your story. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer. In other words, always be prepared, church, to tell your story. When someone comes up to you and says, Man, what is going on? Like, I, I, I just... You know, hey, Bob Broccolino, man, you, you're just, when I see you, there's something about you that's different. Like, I, I see a joy in you that I, it, just, it doesn't make sense. Tell me, what's the deal, man? And then to know that at any time when somebody says that to you, you're ready to say, let me introduce you to Jesus because he's made a difference in my life. You see, that's the story you need to be ready to tell at any time. And a really good gauge, by the way, of your spiritual maturity. If you're wanting to right now understand, I wonder where I am in this. Am I kind of still in my infancy stage in my spiritual walk? Or am I towards the more mature stage in my spiritual walk? It would be the question is, are people coming up to you and asking you about the hope that you have? Do they see the hope in you so much so that they're asking you to, to explain it? And if they're not... Uh, maybe there's a few more things that we need to focus on in 2018 to help grow in spiritual maturity so that people do notice the, the difference in our lives. Here's the last one, is S. It's serving others. God has called us to serve each other. Let me give you an example of this. Aren't you glad that Lou right now, he's back in our sound booth, that he's doing what he's doing so you can hear my voice coming through this mic and in these speakers? My vocal cords are really glad that Lou is here, right? Aren't you glad that Joe is in the back and he's putting these slides up here so you can see and, and, keep, and follow along? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that we had some volunteers in here this week realigning chairs and trying to get some of the wax from Christmas Eve off the chairs? Aren't you, aren't you glad that, that Kim is here helping our deaf community be able to follow along with what I'm saying? Aren't you glad that there are people right now watching your kids up in our Kid Point ministry and hanging out with them? Aren't you glad? <laughs> yeah, amen, right? Aren't you glad that there's a cafe team out there right now preparing to, to feed you some snacks and to give you some coffee? And, and aren't you glad? You see, God has called us to serve one another. In fact, we see this in 1 Peter 4.10. It says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them to serve one another. In other words, the reason God has given you the gifts he's given you is not to serve yourself, not to make something great of yourself, not to make your name great. He gave you those gifts to serve one another. And maybe that's where you need to step up in 2018. Maybe God is putting on your heart right now, I need to, I need to be better at serving. Not necessarily maybe within this church. Maybe God's calling you to serve a neighbor. Maybe there's a way you can serve in a, an organization that you are 
uh, you know, committed to. Maybe, maybe it's a, a mixture of those things, but God has called us to use our gifts to serve others. And I want to encourage you to consider that. So what? So what now? We've talked through H-A-B-I-T-S. We understand that there are these things that we can do to invest more in our eternal, uh, our spiritual maturity, more in eternal focus resolution. As we're considering these things, I want, I want to ask you to do something for me. I don't want you to pick, uh, for me, by the way, I look at this list and I see two things that pop out right away to me. Don't get me wrong, I can work on all six of them, but there's two that really just pop out as the areas that I'm the weakest in that I need to adopt and and work on in 2018. And maybe as you look at that list, there's something that stuck out to you. Maybe it was one thing on that list. Maybe you are a spiritual giant and you don't have anything to work on on that list. I doubt that there's anyone in this room that fits that category. Maybe you look at that list and you're a little bit overwhelmed and you're like, you know, I... I really need to work on four or five things on that list. Here's what I want to ask you to do. Instead of making a commitment to work on one or more of those things all year long, make a commitment this morning to work on whatever it is that you need to work on for 66 days. As we understand that that's the average amount of time it takes to take something that is very a conscious decision maybe for you right now. Maybe you got to wake up tomorrow and make yourself spend time in God's Word. But what I believe is that if you do that for 66 days, on day 67, you're going to wake up and you're going to just uh, naturally, subconsciously, just hunger to spend time in God's Word. Maybe it's investing in a relationship. Maybe it's, uh, I, you know, for the next 66 days, I'm going to make sure my family is in church. I'm going to make sure I'm giving generously. I'm going to make sure I'm serving. I'm going to make sure whatever it is that you need to work on, my ask for you is this, to commit to one or more of these for 66 days and, this is important, to write it down. Maybe right now, you already know what it is. You can write it down on your notes. Share it with someone sitting next to you. Say, I just want you to see the thing that I'm going to be working on so you can hold me accountable to it. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for the way you work in our lives, the way you reveal things to us and you, you prod us and you, you use us to spur each other on towards love and good deeds. God, I pray that you would make it clear to us which of these items, which of these habits we need to form in our own lives and to apply and, and work on. God, we don't want to be a church of good people because you, we believe that you've called us to greatness. God, help us to be great for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.